Yeah, so this is a very smooth bridge, I think, to the to the next session that was already announced um, by the, the previous chair. Um, so this session is, is called Feel Good Narratives for Art Realities, the Origins and Consequences of Oversimplification. I will introduce the, the speakers, which I think is a great lineup, uh, actually. So I hope um, a lot of people will stay uh, in this meeting. Um, I, will, I will introduce the, the speakers in a while. Um, my name is Paul van den Berg. I work in Accorde, the Dutch NGO, a double mandated organization working on humanitarian assistance and development cooperation. Uh, I work as political advisor and I'm also active in the Dutch Relief Alliance, which is an alliance of 14 humanitarian organizations working with uh, national and local NGOs on uh, delivering humanitarian assistance in, in challenging contexts. Um, so, um, yeah, with an ever-increasing and all-plastic interconnected crisis and increasing absence of political will to solve crisis, we are constantly targeted by diverse actors bargaining for our attention and money, both online and offline. What happens when humanitarian actors are using oversimplistic messaging for complex situations is that uh, required news movement solutions allow them support to achieve meaningful change. In line with the overall theme of this great uh, humanitarian congress in Berlin of neglect, uh, this session will actually look at the origins and consequences of oversimplification and what kind of narratives this perpetuates. The discussion will take place against the backdrop of increasing scrutiny towards international actors in perpetuating harmful stereotypes such as white saviorism victimization of affected populations. What we also will discuss in this session is the risks of depoliticizing realities of discrimination and realities that contribute to crisis. And finally, uh, at the end of this session, we will also identify practices that have been successful in addressing complex humanitarian issues and placing the people affected from and center. Uh, a couple of um, logistical or practical remarks um you can you can use social media especially x by um uh, using the the, the um, uh, hashtag hc berlin so you're encouraged as participants to use that uh, hashtag hc berlin uh, comments and questions can be uh, posted uh, via the, the chat below your screen so feel free to post questions uh, um, contribute with remarks. I will also take questions from the audience uh, during this uh, one hour session. There will be a live captioning of this session and uh, the link will be shared in the chats by the support team. And there will also be a live translation, both in French and, and Spanish. Um, so uh, I think that is uh, the practical remarks. Then I will introduce the speakers. Uh, we have uh, but I don't see her actually online, so I hope she will still join us. Uh, Ala al Kari, the, the regional director of the Strategic Initiative for Women in the Horn of Africa. We have uh, John Bryant, research fellow of the Humanitarian Policy Group at ODI, the Overseas Development Institute. We have Mina Jaff, refugee and gender equality advocate and founder of Women's Women's Strategy Round. And we have. Um, Frances Noel, uh, she's a freelance journalist covering violence against women, race, identity, and editor for women under siege. The speakers will also say much more about themselves and about the work they're doing, also in the context of this uh, of this conversation uh, later on. Um, so we have um, well, 55 minutes for the session. It's a, it's a rich topic with many different dimensions. So. Let me try to, to moderate as good as I can. Uh, but again, I hope this will be an interactive conversation. So the audience is also encouraged to uh, to contribute. Um, since I don't see Hala online, maybe the support staff can try to, well, to beep her up and, and, and ask if she still is um, is coming. But I will I will point my first question there to John. Um, so he's, um, he's a researcher and so John, uh, earlier this year, you have looked at the role of narratives and policy change. Can you tell us some of your findings and what aspects of that surprised you? How 
can we overcome some of the well-established dominant narratives that you have identified? So um, feel free to, to tell a bit about yourself because it was a very brief introduction about your role. But um, yeah, then uh, hopefully you can um, guide the way by answering the question that I just posed. Sure. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I hope you can all hear me okay. And uh, yeah, really nice to be to be with you. Um, I can introduce myself maybe later, but for now, I'm, I'm, you, you need to know that I'm, I'm a researcher with the with the Humanitarian Policy Group at ODI. So as, as Paul said, we're doing a, a large piece of work on uh, that's, that's, that's looking at and interrogating humanitarian narratives. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of what we, what we mean by that um, later. But I mean, if I could summarize the key findings so far from a really diverse group of, of policy changes and crises that we've been looking at as part of this work, I just, I just say tension, right? There's tension between a lot of different narratives uh, that the humanitarian sector sets and is also affected by. It. Um, we see that both on the public facing side of how the sector presents itself versus its own reform commitments quite often but there's also tension very clearly on display and we see the consequence of those tension in ongoing crises in in, in operations this is not a chin strokey kind of academic exercise he says readjusting his glasses uh, you know but it actually has has real world consequences in places like ukraine where there have been a narrative of solidarity that has is really interesting because it's 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 challenging the it is less from the forgotten crisis end of the uh you know that where that we're almost used to dealing with you know as humanitarians we're used to to dealing with the with, with a sort of uh, a group of crises that does not get the attentions that it should from the from the from the western media at least ukraine's really interesting because it's uh it it, it the, the amount of solidarity and we can get into this this later the solidarity that it has generated is 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 great for fundraising but it's very different from um the narratives that uh are the humanitarian sector and i'm using that as shorthand for the you know the international humanitarian sector um it yeah, that is used to um and throughout all of these tensions oversimplification as you know as as, as Paul said at the at the top is the, is the title of this session is just shot through all of these uh, and I think these tensions are looking increasingly unsustainable so the findings that I'll talk about are essentially they come from a really basic observation and one I'm I'm really aware of as as somebody who, who sort of collates evidence with with the goal of informing policy change, which is obviously evidence alone is not sufficient to motivate action. And instead, what, what drives change is, is political will. That in turn de depends on a committed group of individuals and, and coalitions that push for change, modify opinions to, to sort of legitimize ideas, delegitimize others. That in turn relies on creating a kind of collective understanding of the problem and a kind of common representation of what the solution should be, ideally. And that's really where narratives come into play. And that's really what we wanted, wanted to focus on with, with, this, with this large piece of work. They're going to be really instrumental in achieving that common understanding. So, I mean, I, I won't sort of go into the kind of set methodology of the work, but, but, but certainly, obviously, there's a large body of literature on, on narrative policy change outside of the humanitarian sector but we, where do we just define them in our work as stories with a purpose essentially stories that to capture attention to shape beliefs to to sort of change attitudes and influence policy and we're not we're not saying either that that narratives are undesirable that they're, they're, they're completely essential to to every aspect of of life and certainly humanitarian um uh, action but our objective was was with this work was being through you know being more explicit about it and, and seeing how the sector uses them we can we can get better at maybe managing some of these tensions and managing the narratives in a way that can best lead ultimately to effective uh, effective and appropriate systems um i mean this audience will be really familiar with some of the key kind of dominant narratives in the sector and 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 the kind of the, the oversimplified sort of nature of the sector that that has been critiqued with very good reason for you know for many decades from from all kind of 
political kind of sides and traditions but you know it has proven to be um as the last speaker said in in the previous session um it's proven to be really resilient and and it's it's resilient partly because of the need to constantly fundraise um the underlying logic of of, of, of the of the dominant humanitarian narratives of you know of helpless victim heroic external force coming in they're legitimate they stand apart from the messy political reality that underlying logic still needs to inform or rather has informed you know the big bulk of fundraising approaches still today we might see fewer of the kind of shock tactics that look extremely dated from from a 2023 perspective now but but that underlying logic is still there i think um and what we argue in in our work is that that you know these tactics are, are certainly difficult to maintain over time without generating fatigue and cynicism and suspicion but conversely very quickly the, the good news is that humanitarian organizations really have a lot more agency in shaping these narratives than i think they they would they, they perhaps think of themselves and perhaps that you know that they present to the to the outside world and that's really kind of the, the starting point for this um very happy to talk more about but it's obviously as paul says it's a huge topic um but yeah i don't want to uh talk too much in the ending stages but um, that's a very broad brush summary of, uh, of 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 where we're at with our own work so, thanks yeah, thank you that, that was that was very helpful already i have one follow-up question um because i mentioned in my introduction that um as we speak, a lot of sort of felt reflection is taking place in the humanitarian sector. Um, so you see a lot of discussions about, say, lo locally lacking humanitarian assistance, about white saviorism, about decolonization of the system. Do you see that already translated in organizations, especially larger players, also changing their narratives? Or is the, well, the, the urge for fundraising um, still dominant, which makes it very difficult to well, to, to have a different position and, and a storytelling in place, is, mm -hmm. is that, how, how does these two processes connect? I, I mean, I'd say, I'd, I'd, I'd say that's, that's certainly the key tension as well, you know, I'm coming at it from, from my own background, having looked in the past at, at, at those very topics around supporting local responses and, and, and decolonizing aid and what that means. Um, I think there's an extraordinary degree of tension between the those internal kind of commitments and uh, the, the the fundraising departments one of the one of the real sort of um uh striking things perhaps you know you asked you asked me what the sort of a surprising finding was the degree of separation in large ngos between their the 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 policy and the operational and the and you know and even the the sort of comms departments from the fundraising departments just in terms of the basics of knowing who those individuals are often in you know in large in, in large you know federations or or, or large uh, you know large networks of, of organizations is is very striking um and actually you know thinking about how we best communicate our work to be, you know, to sort of drive change in the sector ourselves. There's a real need for us to engage with those audiences as well, because that's outside of our own, you know, of our own set of our own sort of usual group of policy, policy people. There are some very good um, isolated practices that I've seen uh, on, on your point. I think, um, uh, I think Christian aid's public messaging has been, you know, is, 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 is one, I think that, uh, stands out for me as as something that is is based on a sort of solidarity based messaging. You've also had, um, I think, MSF uh, National Societies uh, in, in uh, I think Denmark. Um, sorry if that's 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 wrong. I've have done a very effective piece on, you know, the white saviorism problem and and kind of attempting to communicate that to an external audience. So I think that that's really important. But yeah, you're right. I think it's a I think it's a it's a it's a sort of uh, there's a lot of tension there in those two in those two agendas really at the moment thanks uh thank you uh I'll, I'll come back to you uh later with some some other questions yeah. i have but uh we'll, we'll go to to mina um as a feminist activist with, with lived experience in migration and currently supports migrant women in the uk how do you feel today's discourse on refugees in europe and what can we do to stem this narrative. 
you have to unmute uh, Mia. Thank you, Paul, for the question. Before I'm starting, I was like, yeah, I'm a feminist and activist and a person with also lived experience but have, expect have been working in migrant and refugee setting for one and a half decade. And the, right now I'm based in the UK and working for a charity called Hippie Spruce, working with the uh, uh, migrant women who are uh, migrant women who are kept under restriction of the UK government. In response to your question, sadly, when it came to refugee, the narrative of framing a conversation is not really new. We have seen discrimination of refugee and stereotyping of refugee since ever. I myself been refugee and working in the setting. And back in 2016, after we saw increasing of refugee to coming to the EU, I saw a gap in inclusion of women, especially in women and girls, and a trauma-informed response. So I funded Women Refugee Route at the time as a response to include women and girls in meaningful participation that could be able to challenge and change the current system. And we have, we actually in Women's Refugee Route uh, were actively in engaging in high levels events, including the negotiation on that then refugee global compact, among other resolutions that were made on behalf of refugee. And I also back then really realized, even being part of this conversation, how the narrative then even was uh, dividing refugee, especially after different regions, a region, as also John mentioned, like, you know, how you prioritize uh, one country from other country and this was this is not something new um, because it was also very very clear back then and uh, we we continue to see politicians now regularly bash refugee and migrant to win election and this is a very clear uh, picture for us here in the UK right now and um, and um, and yeah, and that's create also a kind of hate speech that have been already translated to a cruel migration uh, policy in many contexts that are continue. And I think also, as you see, my response for 2016 was like found an organization that could be a response to the lack and the gap. And now I'm coming to another stage in a transformative stage in my life where I'm thinking the only chance uh, and the only chance we have left, we can change the narrative, is actually to reimagine the system and the meddling power. Uh, in, and in my experience, why is it good to collaborate with INGO, civil society, and the conversation and advocacy about, for refugee to pass that knowledge and that experience to refugee and have this conversation together? We struggle a lot. We struggle a lot with resources, but also in power balance. And, and especially like we do that as well within the organization where you don't see a lot of lived experience people. We do have them working in organization, but we don't have them with a specific, we don't open the door for them to work with a specific area that have a huge impact. Uh, on power dynamic like fundraising is also John's base uh, touch base on this so uh, what we need basically now is coming together including funder that have been the part of the harm and they have been creating this broken system um, and uh, yeah and uh, we have seen a system where I NGO and grassroots organization have to con compete together like compete against each other for a very small sum and that have been also interfering with our work and building a collective movement, trust and accountability. So I really hope it can be as a last chance for us to unite a goal for a human right for everyone and like also hold funders accountable and funders and government accountable for this. And over years, I also, and this is the reason, like, right? because over years, I have seen so many activists and colleagues leaving the human rights work 
and especially those with lived experience because they are burned out because they no, uh, they never or no longer had long-term support and flexible call funding for the impact of the work they actually did. And they were always invited to participate to be a speaker in one and the other conference, but it was not really inclusion or participation of meaningful, uh, meaningfully, because the humanitarian sector is still a mirror of those who are not abolishing Connolly, Connolly, Connolly and patriarchal thinking. And this is very clear. And this is also, is more and more, luckily, this is in different country. It's a conversation that is going on within the civil society, but also charity, that there is also many European countries that are not touching base on this conversation. Like also John mentioned for then Denmark, where I am, where I grew up myself. And uh, for that, again, we really need to uh, reimagine the system that, di that distribute power and we see governments and INGO also adopt feminist uh, foreign policy and gender policy, which is very good and needed. And this is all the solution, but we actually need to live off to those standards and not to use it for political convenience and they have to pull a resources and funding for civil society behind this as well. Thank you. Well, Mina, um, quite a sobering story, I think, but very realistic, of course. And I, I fully agree that in, in many countries in Europe, refugees are sort of painted as the sort of, well, the, the core of, of many problems. For example, in the Netherlands, the, the fact that the housing market is is failing and in, in, insufficient houses are available that is also blamed to refugees which is actually only a tiny part of, of of say migration coming to the netherlands i think that is so the framing but also the facts are are um well are not properly um, represented here um what, what what some organizations have done and i would like to hear your opinion about that is to to work with sort of role models for example, in the Netherlands, you have, uh, for example, a, ma a, a mayor of a, of a city uh, having a, a migration background. Is that something that you are enthusiastic about, or is it also problematic? Because not, well, not every migrant, of course, can come to that. Not every refugee is able to to reach that position. Um, but yeah, it's a struggle, I think. But I, I would like to hear your views on what would be a sort of counter narrative in, in this very problematic, um, well, position. Yeah. I think it's super problem problematic in first step, like having a role model, there is a mirror because it's not everyone who wants to be a doctor. It's not everyone who wants to be a um, founder of a founder of an NGO. It's not everyone who wants to be a researcher, a journalist. Like there's so many things that refugee and people they are we are people we're real people like you and everyone in this panel we have all our hope and goals we want to achieve different things in our life and it's so dangerous for having a narrative who is good and who is the bad ones like who is like you know those who is the bad one is actually the worst one who do the job we never we will be able to do ourselves and it's very dangerous to like really put this positive uh, it's good. Like, I mean, I respect those who even like managed to be in the election and being in the mirror of the, of that municipality is not what I'm criticizing. What I'm criticizing is actually, um, make this very positive narrative about that and leave everyone behind, which actually do a tremendous contribution to the country. And for those who are not able to do this contribution is because they are stuck in a limbo in a system that is broken. And this is broken, especially because of the government and because of the election and because funders, donors, philanthropy have been very behind in their work to realize what they actually have been creating. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, um, it's not, it's not the way you had that, that's for sure. Um, so the whole idea of role models is, um, I think a problem in itself as well. 
uh, let's go to the the role of the media because we've we've touched about say the sector itself and john spoke about that um uh, mina uh, spoke about uh, well the perception and the framing of uh, refugees um media of course also is a very crucial player in this and uh so I, I'll, I'll move to Francis now and, and Greta Bhala is also online, so I'll, I'll, I'll um, go to you after that. But uh, Francis, um, what responsibility do you think that the media have in oversimplification of um, uh, the message when it comes to humanitarian disasters and, and, and people in, uh, in difficult circumstances? Well, not to oversimplify anything, but I'd say a lot. Um, <laughs> I'll give you a, a little bit of a background. Um, I used to be um, a communications officer in the humanitarian space. So I feel like I've bounced around that entire storytelling ecosystem to know well enough um, all of the shortcuts that we've all been taking. So I'll start with the media, as I think as the model exists now, um, the media does at least outwardly look like it, you know, is the sole, um, sole power player. It's the, um, the, the main actor who is influencing, you know, different palettes, um, particularly of the public, but I would say as well as, um, communications departments. So, um, we've seen, you know, as early as this week, um, when there's an acute crisis, media really does scramble to be the first to bring, you know, certain information to light. And that's where I would say, you know, the most and the gravest sins are committed because just because you're the first doesn't mean you're the most informed. In fact, it often means the opposite. So um, what details do they reach for first? Like which you know, bits of information are they clamoring for? Um, it's usually the most salacious, the most sensational, the most traumatic, most exploitative, because that's what media still believes um, feeds public appetite. So that's also where comms departments come in. So I think a lot of um, communications teams um, is are stuck in like a feedback loop with the media where it feels like it's just this feeding frenzy every time there's a new emergency because um, they also have their own motivations. You know, organizations want and need visibility. They want to be positioned as experts to be called on to bring attention to, you know, what the organization has been doing um, even before this, the there was a spotlight to be had, you know. Um, there's a... a fundraising motive um as mina said you know like the competition is fierce um humanitarian actors are you know thusly i would say very culpable in diluting and packaging um information um how they think the media want it packaged um i remember being you know in in my former life as a comms officer um writing executive summaries um crafting tweets and press releases that were tailored for the very purpose of a poll quote or a soundbite. So by now, you know, these are such well-trodden shortcuts um, and freely giving out the juiciest uh, pieces of information in the hopes that someone will bother to circle back and read the full report where all the nuance and context is. But I'll tell you what, they, they won't. They don't because we didn't condition them to. So that's where I would locate the greatest failure is um, is in the lack of um, of responsibility as knowledge keepers. I think um, it was, yeah, John um, said, mentioned, you know, agency that we have to own. So everyone blaming the other party, you know, that's what they want. That's what they respond to. You know, comms departments will say, this is what the media wants. The media will say, this is what the public wants. Um, how did that come to be, though? You know, um, we have to take ownership of our, of 
our role in this conversation. It's not a one-way conversation and we need to stop pretending that it is. Um, there's more agency to be had than maybe we're willing to own up to. Thanks, Francis. Um, is there a way to break through this sort of interconnected dynamics of the sector thinking that the media want to hear that and the media thinks that the audience want to hear certain messages, how to counter that? Are there any good examples in your, in your own experience, maybe on your practice of, well, journalists or journalist platforms that have been able to, to find a way out of this, well, hijack system? Well, I'll say right now that I think the conditions are are right for something new, mm -hmm. something um, more nuanced. Especially because I think I think it was John who had mentioned before, you know, the the compassion fatigue. You know, there's we're living in you know an information era where we do passively consume narratives and news um, to the point where you know you don't have to try very hard to um, to be bludgeoned with information that you don't know how to process as, you know, um, you know a member of society. So what do people do? They, they turn off, right? So I think what people are looking for now and where I'm seeing, you know, journalism adapting is something more substantive. They, people actually do want context now. They want to and not be told, but they want to be offered meaning in that information. And so, you know, as a journalist, I exclusively work on um, long form feature reporting, which means that I do have the space and the bandwidth to explain and to give context. Um, in my other role as editor for the Women's Media Center's Women Under Siege section, which um, covers gendered violence in global context before it started as a project that looked at sexualized violence and conflict, which is, you, you can't get any juicier than that, you know, um, in, in terms of that mouth-watering salaciousness that, you know, people um, usually, people as in, you know, other um, members of the media usually, you know, cling for and um, have conditions the public to locate in certain conflicts in certain parts of the world. To answer your question, how do we move away from that? You have to offer them to something different. You mm -hmm. have to, um, you have to try something new. And actually, you know, let's let's pull it back. You have to want to try something new. It does not take long um, to normalize. Something. We know that. So if we want to move away from, you know, the soundbite, the, um, the extraction, the exploitation, the sensationalism, we have to offer something new. And there has to be, you know, institutional will to want to, you know, to want to, and I already hate myself for this analogy, to, you know, tread a new path. Um, because, you know, we, as it's human nature to want to take the shortcut, right? We make shortcuts in, um, in our logic all the time. But yeah, I, I have to say, you know, you have to, you have to want to try something different. You have to want to sustain um, curiosity to invite people to learn more and you'd be surprised. I think a lot of people are, are coming to that because they want the slow churn journalism. They want, you know, a lot more, um, a lot more analysis, a lot more critique that is thoughtful and slow and doesn't feel like a crisis all the time. Because I think that's where the media landscape has climaxed to. Thanks, uh, Francis. I actually already answered a comment in the chat, which is um, maybe to counter 
we need to understand what stories the audience will respond to. And and I think you said that, well, uh, at least part of the public is very much willing to consume much more nuanced and much much more in-depth analysis instead of simple stories and sound bites and an amplification of the actual situation on the ground, which 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 ha is is also not easy, yeah, because of course you also have to compete with a lot of fake news and disinformation floating around. Um, I mean, we see that on a daily basis now, also in the uh, the situation in Gaza and uh, Israel. I mean, it's it's also for the consumer quite quite difficult to yeah to to differentiate between sort of valid and true information uh, from serious journalists and well, a lot of disinformation, which is which is spread all around on the internet. So, um, but yeah, at least it's a promising, uh, uh, it's an avenue eh, for for more new, nuanced uh, messaging and and stories uh, from the media. That's that, that's the gist of your contribution here. And indeed, yeah, uh, not... it, maybe some big players, maybe some large media outlets need to start, and then the others will follow. <laughs> yeah, I will. I'll say this is mostly for you know, like the the big media outlets, you know, who always, you know, kind of retract immediately and say, you know, but this is what people will respond to. We don't know that until we offer it to them. So. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I'll go to, um, to Hala. Uh, I don't see you uh, on camera, but uh, I see that you're online. So let me um, ask you a question um, as well. Um, as a writer, as well as your your work as a regional director of the Strategic Initiative for Women in the Horn of Africa, you've been challenging uh, simplistic and re-victimizing narratives as they relate to women's rights and activism. Can you elaborate on what you think some of these most persistent narratives came? Uh, what is your strategy in countering them? So what have, yeah, what have you done to sort of counter the um, oversimplistic messaging um, and uh, so, yeah, maybe some concrete examples would, would be helpful in your own practice. Thank you very much. You know, that's a very big question, sure. you know, <laughs> how can we address, um, the overly simplified messaging and, and, and how can we challenge, you know, the consistent depoliticization of the, of the work we're doing? you know, under uh, pretexts and claims of um, impartiality and uh, neutrality, which is, um, it's often quite misleading, you know, because you end up completely biased. And, and, and um, you know, I, I don't think there is something called impartiality and neutrality. We have our positions in this life and we have our stance. And as... Uh, a civil society and as an as activists, as people who, you know, consciously consciously chosen to be in this field, you know, um, you know, it was expected that we should be aware of that. The issue is um, the uh, field of um, civil activism and humanitarian aid for the past um, twenty five years have witnessed significant transformation and it's more or less becoming an industry that needs to sustain its existence rather than um you know um a principled wave of activism that meant to respond and to create change you know so I have been part of the humanitarian aid. I've also, I'm also now, you know, I'm an activist and part of civil society. And um, unfortunately, you know, um, um, the way I see it that, um, you know, both sectors has been largely uh, commercialized and and have been um, um, becoming uh, more or less, um, you know, uh, part of, um, um, you know, um, like they were put into boxes and, and, and you cannot cross the boundaries, otherwise um, you will be uh, punished, 
you know, so you have to act within a certain framework. And and that ends up in, in, in the fact that, for example, you could see someone who is completely anti-women rights uh, leading a huge gender division in um, in an organization. That's something I have seen quite often, and it's it's rather, you know, a joke because it speaks to the fact that it's not anymore where where do you stand, you know, in terms of real life, in terms of your principles, but to what extent you were able to meet and satisfy, you know, the industry. And, and it also speaks to what extent we are serious about those jargons, you know, um, when it comes to issues of equality, um, you know, having feminist foreign policies, um, allowing local actors more authorities and, 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 and things like that. So if you don't understand what it takes, and that's really an issue of principle, it's an issue of commitments, it's an issue of, you know, um, making sure that, um, you know, those who are engaged in this sector morally and principally, they have the capacity to be part um, to be part of it because it's very challenging. And if you are not guided by clear set of principles, regardless of the books of policies and and things like that, that doesn't that doesn't help. So um, so I think um, you know it's we are um, again it's a, a massive challenge, I would say. You know, and 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 a challenge that requires conversation like this, and it requires also shifts in terms of how we do, um, um, how do we engage in this field, and how how do we work on? Sorry, I had a terrible morning, so <laughs> you have to forgive me. You know, I had I had an an accident, and but it's a small accident, so I'm glad that I was able to join you. Yeah. So, so yes, um, so, so this is, um, um, and, and rethink, you know, modalities of engagements under the current um, uh, political context that we are operating within um, and, and a better understanding of the context that we are working within and investment on creating models and, and uh, you know, and engagements with with actors um, um, on the ground in a way that every intervention would make um, a lot of sense. Another example that I would give is um, I've uh, I stayed in Sudan after the war, um, you know, like for um, two and a half months, and uh, I've seen, you know, for example, some of the crisis from a humanitarian angle that. People they really didn't have any cash, but I also see how the I saw how the market was flooded with fresh vegetables and and you know and all kind of um, you know goods and at an extremely cheap price next to getting it for free. But then I have um, a community you know of displaced that are really hungry and they can't even afford. That very little money, but then if you look at the modality of how you know the food support operations, you know work and function, you know it's it functions in a way that it destroys the local market. It pushes those poor farming community into disparity, and so on. Another example, you know, as a feminist institution. I found myself sometimes, you know, interviewing people who has memorizing and they have understanding and not understand, they claim they have understanding of what does it mean to be part of this institution. But then, you know, a month or two, I find out that they are actually religious fundamentalists. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, um, so, so I think, and, and, and right now, Within my organization, we completely change the dynamics in terms of, you know, um, how we can recruit people. But it's extremely hard. It's very, very difficult, you know, um, 
because you are trying to function differently in a setup and an environment and quote unquote an industry that functions in a certain way. And then amidst all that, you have to avoid not to be punished for your principal positions or for taking a stance, being an institution, um, 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 you know, working in the South. That happens to us, by the way. You know, when we took a position um, anti, um, um, you know, um, the migration policies, we were punished. We were deprived of of funding, and it wouldn't come straight to to your face. But it, you will hear that you know grants were blocked, you know, and then and then you will hear, well, how come you take your money and then you criticize our policy, <laughs> you know. And, and and things like that. So for a sesam based organization, you know, it's it's very, you know, it's a struggle. It's it's a political struggle. You know, it's um, it's the idea either you comply or you will be banished or yeah. alienated. So how to navigate our way amidst all that? You know, this is where we are. You know, this is our everyday fight, our everyday struggle. Yeah, over to you. Thank you, Salah, for your very um, um, clear and uh, and straightforward and outspoken reflections. And uh, I think it, it, it very much resonates. Um, what you also say is, um, let's say, vested institutional interests of the, say, industry are so strong that maybe other trends uh, or efforts to 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 break out of that um of that systems are failing because of the the fact that so much money is in full so that is quite a i think yeah strong blocking power uh, and and frank has an interesting question in the chat um he asked do you think that male domination in decision making positions also in the humanitarian sector even it's a major barrier for change are we enough aware of that what is your take on that question? Can you repeat the questions? Yeah. So that, you think, I guess it, yeah. that male domination in decision-making positions, also in the humanitarian sector, they mean... You mean male better. domination? Male domination. So the fact that... Uh, you're... It's patriarchal. Excuse me? Is, is it... Does he mean patriarchal, male domination? Yeah, yeah all right. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the best way to say it is patriarchy. You know, and patriarchy is not about you know um, male or female. It's a construct. You know that you know that can go into different levels. You know, sexism, undermining, and and things like that. But I think it's also you know um, the politics of uh, of discrimination and who are we you know, in that spectrum. And do we really deserve to be up to be partners, you know? Um and um the lack of transparency, you know, the fact that, you know, we are really struggling to, for example, raise funding for my own country, Sudan, from twenty six percent to thirty percent, you know, of the total amount that's needed. You know, but nobody cares. You know, we we are struggling to speak about the fact that women, you know, sexual violence against women, it should matter, you know. But then when you sit in the around the table with, you know, quote unquote experts on peace and security, you know, they try to dismiss and and, and deal with our people and deal with women as collateral damage. So it's it's not only women, but it's a whole population in 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 countries like Sudan, African countries, countries in the south, often dealt with as collateral damage. And there is lack of transparency. You know, we need to believe that, you know, we are getting a favor. The truth of the matter, we are not, according to the human rights law, according to the humanitarian law, according to this, to how this world functions. According to the economy, uh, to the global economy, we do contribute. We have contributed for years and years, and we continue to contribute. You know, but the reality, you know, 
um, that contributions when it comes to extending support and aid and according to the, you know, to the code, to the social, you know, conduct that we have in this world, you know, um, and, and the frameworks that should keep us together living in peace, you know, is not working. You know, we are not being looked at as, as equal. You know, it's um, uh, it's okay for us to die because we are, you know, um, uh, uh, and 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 it's not okay for other people to die who looks different. You know, and and that's such a painful reality. You know, um, it's okay for women from our countries to be raped, and 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 not for other women to be raped. You know, and and that kind of you know discriminatory construct. It has its manifestation in the humanitarian industry. It has its manifestation on the size of support. You know, it's uh, it was told to us right in the face, and we have to say no. We deserve. But I mean, I'm Francis. What she said, you know, we don't have the tools, you know, to um, uh, to say no. We deserve. We contribute equally to this world because. Unfortunately, the media institution that you know um, is not also um, uh, supporting that. Um, so, so it's it's patriarchy, but it's also beyond patriarchy. You know, it's um, uh, it's the construct itself need really to that we should hold ourselves accountable to the human rights law. We should hold ourselves accountable to the humanitarian law, and and we should really. Um, um, you know, the, it's it's becoming such shameful issue. This double standard, it became really shameful. Yeah, yeah. over to you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Allah. And uh, yeah, oh, you already mentioned Francis, and there's a question to Francis in the in the chat. Um, I would hope that the development for more in-depth, long-term communication in this crisis would come through. Unfortunately, but we see our communication is really the opposite. In social media, people don't use the opportunity to click follow up to more in-depth reporting. We don't see people that want to see more than 10 seconds of video. So where do you see the development that you described? Thank you. That was the question uh, from um, one of the participants. I mean, it's a great question, isn't it? Um, the, the media landscape, especially the social media landscape, is looking particularly hostile to um, any kind of... Um, substantive um knowledge sharing um i don't i actually don't think that um that those platforms even um function for information anymore it's x and its former iteration i've always been a mess um this is you know they've developed into ecosystems where um we are shouting across the void at each other and not really consuming anything that um that we can process so i mean that's that's a great question um i would say immediately right off the bat don't go to social media do not go to social media if you want any kind of news um i mean there are only infinite examples of how um, disinformation and fake news have been um, dispersed and thrive in those ecosystems. So um, I also imagine if you are a social media user, you know, at any point when there's an emergency or um, an, or a crisis, um, how it feels in your body to to see that in your feed all the time, you know, your nervous system just shuts down. Don't go there for that. Um, I do think um, where I'm seeing the most promise, um, but also, you know, kind of um, straddling the the edge of, of danger there as well as like newsletters is in, um, you know, I would say trusted news sites that, you know, can accommodate like beautiful long form um, long form journalism. There's, um, I would say, podcasts have, you know, it, it, their dark sides as well, but there's also 
um, plenty of opportunity to um, to have more of um, I think more space, more time to really sink into an issue. Um, there are other, you know, um, forms of media available. Um, you just have to <laughs> you just have to seek them out. Fortunately. Um, yeah. That's Excuse nice. me if my yeah. my voice is failing. It's very, very early here in California. Um yeah, um I would say, you know, like social media is the is the passive most ready, um most ready, you know, form of media. But you you should know what you're getting when when you go to it. So I would say, you know, yeah, seek out other places and, and build build trust with your sources thanks uh, francis that's the best piece of advice actually that i got today don't go to social media i think it's uh it's a very it's something that we can all take uh take home after this session uh, we're already nearing the end of this of this session now uh, the, the next one which is um which is on uh which called notorious ignorance anthropology and attention in the military sector that will start at one o'clock but we have to round off in uh, approximately three Four minutes. So I will um, give everybody uh, of the panelists the floor for sort of one final short comment or maybe uh, an advice, recommendation, or maybe a, a, an old lesson. Um, so um, I'll go first to uh, Nina. Yeah, well, I think I, after Francis gave us a good lesson for today, don't go to social media. There is also a part that we didn't we touched base on which also fell in with like you know lack of resources lack of um power balance and whatever that that we have been putting in this such a harmful spaces to and we are the one who do the most impact basically there's one very very important part of it is the well-being and the care and around our work that we need to remember and we need to make space for and need to be reflected about so my ending will be that we go out from this conference of making space for more trauma-informed workspaces trauma-informed processes and procedures and um, yeah taking care of yourself and don't go to the social media if you do make sure that you yeah disconnect with their well-being mind Thanks a lot, Mina, for that important uh, recommendation. I'll go to John. Sure, uh, really interesting conversation. Um, I suppose I would I would just repeat what I said at the top, really, which is that humanitarian organizations not only have a responsibility, but also have a lot of agency in challenging these kind of narratives that come out of um, either social media or, you know, or, or, or the wider kind of media landscape. Ukraine was a was a was a unique response in many ways. It is a unique response, but it was also a missed opportunity to reframe um, the enormous levels of funding that went to Ukraine uh, uh, to broaden the, the victims of of that crisis. Uh, and actually, you know, um, none of this would none of this is a lie. All of this is all of this is true. You know, there were there were food price inflationary effects across the world um, that could have been. Uh, and I think, in hindsight, should have been uh, challenged by the humanitarian sector. Um, that the, the 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 group of people in need should have been expanded uh, more globally to to sort of better um, to to better to better distribute uh, that that very generous those very generous levels of funding um, that um, uh, that Ukraine received. Really, um, perhaps also a note of caution on, sol on on solidarity, which I've heard a lot across this conference. Um, a really it's a really interesting sort of term and i think one set up almost in counter to the kind of traditional humanitarian narratives that we've that we've been kind of grappling with in this call really i suppose my my reflection on it with the with the work so far is that it may also it may be great for galvanizing funding and support uh, i think it may also be may also be vulnerable to kind of changing moods and limited attention spans really uh we have a uh, a new um uh, paper out on um 
uh, on Germany as a, as a as a humanitarian donor that was published yesterday, um, co-authored with with colleagues from the Centre for Humanitarian Action. That really emphasised that and the, and the dangers of of, of of simplified narratives. I think in in driving a lot of the uh, changes in humanitarian policy in the country over the past over the past ten years. That's really starting to again come up against some tension. So loads to digest. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you for the thank you for the discussion, Paul. Thank and you. all the panelists. And very interested in that paper on Germany. So maybe you can put uh, the link. To the Absolutely, we we'll do. Oh, yeah. Um, Ala. Your final comment. I think I think humanitarian aid and you know they need more than delivering you know or working on. I, I think shaping the narratives it's becoming critical, you know, and influencing, you know, um, um, societies. Um, it's it's absolutely um, becoming part of the burden of humanitarian aid, and I think it's. It's very important to integrate the language of equality, um, the language of um, you know of of human rights, um, and um, as part of the um, um, of the humanitarian aid um, um, engagements. And I think you know that starts um, with home. You know, it starts with the northern hemisphere. Start with you know. Um, in changing um, um, the narrative and changing the the vision, it's not about charity. It's about a stable, peaceful world that we are all living in, and we all get affected affected with whatever happened in any part of it. You know, it's not about you know feeling good about yourself. It's it's about contributing, you know, to the stability and the peace of your own home. And your own surroundings, you know. Um, so I think the narrative of humanitarian aid needs really to match, you know, the current, um, you know, complex political realities that we are faced with. Yeah, over to you, the Hala. And finally, Francis, can you trunk your early comments on stopping with social media? But uh, yeah, the floor is yours, and then we'll round this meeting off. Sure, I'll be I'll be as quick as possible. Um, I think you know, just jumping off the social media point, we need to reimagine our relationship to urgency. And I'm talking to the media, I'm talking to um, communication teams, I'm I'm talking to the public as well. There's obviously good reason to respond immediately, of course, to um, to a crisis. But when there isn't one, we need to be constructing the scaffolding to support pause to get our bearings and to, um, I think, forge new routes to seek information when an emergency arises. Just because it's the way things always have been doesn't mean it's the way that they always will be. Um, If you look at media consumption and how it has evolved over time to respond to how we have been disseminating information, um, that should be testament enough. Um, We can evolve. We have to want to, and um, I'll just say that storytelling has to, um, because what has been the the operating belief and practice is disintegrating. Um, trust in trust in media is at an all time low, so we need, we need to change. Um, we need to try something else, and um, we have to. Um, but in order to do so, we have to want to. Thanks. Uh, and thank you, uh, Francis, Mina, Ala, and John for your great contributions. Uh, as already said, this, this was a, this is a very huge topic. And I think we were o- only able to sort of scratch the surface. So there are many, many other things to say about this uh, fascinating topic and a lot of work to be done as, as became clear from this conversation. But, uh, yeah, thanks a lot for your excellent reflections and, uh, like I said, the next session starts at one, Notorious Ignorance, Anthropology, and Attention in the Humanitarian Sector. Also, thanks to the people uh, online for participating, and um, have a great day.